pleasure to host uh, ISR, Conf ISR Motors 4Q result conference call and, and it's a pleasure to host Mr. Siddharth Lal as well as Mr. Lalit Malik. Uh, both are here. So now I would like to hand over the mic to uh, Siddharth for his result comment as well as his comment on the outlook, etc. And then we can open it up for the Q&A. Thank you and over to you. Management. Thank you and good evening to all of you and thanks for joining in so late on Friday evening on for our uh, call. Um, we concluded our ISO Motors Limited board meeting uh, earlier this evening and as a result we have our um, our results for quarter four of last year as well as for the full year of 2018-19. Um, I'm going to go through some of the highlights of the financials and then the business highlights. So for the consolidated ISO Motors Limited financials for Q4 as well as FY 2018-19, um, for the quarter we had a revenue of around 2,500 crores which was down around 1% from the same quarter last year and for the full year our revenue was close to 9,800 crores which is up 9% from the previous year. Our EBITDA was at 685 crores um, for the quarter with a 27.4% margin and 2,900 crores approximately with uh, a margin of 29.6% for the uh, for the full year. Our profit after tax was 545 crores, um, down 16% from the same quarter last year, and 2,220 crores for the full year, which is up 2%. Um, overall, on the business side, Royal Enfield, we had um, motorcycle sales for the quarter were down 13% uh, to 1.97 lakhs. And for the year, we were marginally up from 8.2 to 8.23 lakhs for the full year. So that's 8.23 lakhs for last year. Mm. We continued with dealer expansion last year. We added 90 dealers for the year, 37 for the quarter, up to a total of 915 dealers. Internationally, we now have 42 exclusive stores across 19 countries. And we recently entered the South Korean market in, in the first exclusive store in Seoul. Mm. We've, um, we've had an outstanding response last year. It was a big year for us from a new product perspective because we had an absolutely amazing response to our new twins, which have created uh, waves in markets in India and around the world. So it's really a revolutionary product, in our opinion, uh, which, has done, which has had a great launch and initial phase in in the first few months of its, uh, the products being in the market with uh, and consumers riding the product. Um, we've launched and commenced deliveries in various in international markets. Of course, India was first, and then after that, US, UK, Europe, Thailand, Indonesia, Colombia, Argentina, Australia. We've commenced in all of these countries, um, and things are going very well with all the top accolades and awards in India and in some markets around the world for our new twins. So we're delighted about the performance of our new twins. We've had other new products such as Bullet Trials, which we had as well uh, more recently. And also we had our entire portfolio, which is an enormous endeavor, was shifted from to anti-lock braking um, motorcycles well in time for the um, regulatory uh, requirements. So we were able to shift our entire portfolio of motorcycles to ABS. Mm. Other highlights for ordinary updates on uh, Royal Enfield is we've uh, Balam Baragal manufacturing plant phase two is construction is largely over and installation is commencing. Production will commence in second half of 2019-20. Our Chennai Technical Center is near completion. Uh, the PD team has partially moved in product development, and the rest of the team will move in by next month. And by the second half of this year the admin block will be up and running and the teams will move in. So that will be uh, the full move to the Chennai Technical Center from various uh, small and rented offices that we have across Chennai because of the growth we've had over the last many years. And including, of course, in some of our old 
uh, location, like silver fuel, etc. Um, we also completed a very important ride, which is called One Ride, the ninth edition of that, but which is one of the largest motorcycle community rides in the world, with participation from 305 cities across 35 countries. And we had 15,000 enthusiasts in India alone from 187 uh, cities and towns in India. So it's a big ride that we conducted, you know, the same day around the world, um, and it went off really well. So that's on Royal Enfield business. On VCV, um, I'll tell you both about the financials and the business. Mm. Our revenue for the quarter was just over 3,200 crores, and for the year was 11,600 crores, which was an all-time high. The EBITDA for the quarter was 274 crores, and for the year was 973 crores, giving an EBITDA margin of 8.6% for quarter four against 9.5 last year, largely because of very heavy discounting and, and some falling uh, volumes. Um, and for the full year, our EBITDA margin was 8.4% as against 9% last year. That resulted in a profit after tax of 139 crores for the quarter and 475 crores for the year. Mm. Truck sales, trucks and buses sales, sorry, for quarter four were at 21,000 units, down 9% from the same quarter last year. But for the full year, we closed at 73,000 units, up 11% and an all-time high of 73,000. Um, and the 11% growth last year was broadly in line with the industry growth of 12%. Um, the second half of last year, of course, was impacted by uh, various issues such as the implementation of the axle load norms which, uh, which reduced demand for some time and some liquidity constraints with NDFCs. But, uh, and margins were under pressure con because of all-time high discounts and disruptive pricing and uh, where we want to make sure that we continue our profitability as well as uh, growth and market share. So we try to have the optimum balance of all of these. Um, we've had excellent progress on our new products as well in trucks with the launch of new Pro 2000 series of light and medium duty trucks of our new electric bus as well as the industry first seven speed transmission and new products based on the new axle norms of 48 tons and 55 tons. So all of that's come in in the recent past. We've also successfully entered into two new international markets in Indonesia and in South Africa. Um, in these markets, we've gone with the uh, UD brand, which is owned by Volvo. So Volvo is distributing our trucks in these markets under the UD brand. And we see an enormous potential or good potential in these markets in the coming years. And that's all from us, from Aisha Motors for now. So over to you for questions now. Sure. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask questions may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Kapil Singh from Namura Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, firstly, I wanted to check uh, when you are looking at the sales currently, uh, what is it that is impacting them? If you could give some color on both how inquiries are moving and how the conversion rates are moving and uh, uh, top two or three reasons that you have assessed which is impacting them? So nothing happened in the quarter, so, but the la larger trend that we are seeing for the last three, four quarters or I would say two, three quarters has been, there has been a bit of a drop in inquiries. Um, uh, and largely, you know, this is like post-Diwali time for us at least. Uh, while the Diwali GDL went up exceedingly well, but after that we did saw drop and you, know, you can attribute it to you know, slow down, increasing the price bikes and so on and so forth. And that continues so far. So, you know, okay. overall we also had a bit of a, okay, friend, when you are, when you are large and when you are dependent on a few states, uh, then all these problems also begin to hit you, uh, till the states issues get repaired, you know. Kerala went down for us after the floods. It's come back, but not, certainly not to the extent that, uh, it, it, what it was doing for us in the past. 
uh, larger proportion for us as opposed to others as with the CLT sales. So I'm giving you all the answers now and without you having asked so that you don't, others don't have to repeat. CLT sales as a proportion of our overall sales is, is, is quite large. Uh, February and March, the government did no CSG sales or CSG buying from their perspective. If we had all the twins that the market needs, both India and internationally, then you know the numbers would be, and the ASPs and all this stuff would be very, very kind of different. So these are the broad three four things that I can speak about. <coughs> okay, and is there a drop in conversion rates as well? The conversion is largely the same. So in quality to booking and booking to sales, there's, there's hardly any change. Okay. Is the is the just the num the volume of Folks who are coming in physically to the stores, that, that's a lower number than, than the past. Okay. And uh, just one more question on uh, your material cost and other costs. Uh, we have seen a sharp increase for the quarter. Uh, is there uh, any one-time items there, or uh, this will be the normalized end rate for, for both of these? So the material cost is still stabilizing post uh, the 100% conversion to ABS that happened in Q4. So there is a bit of a stability factor over there. Uh, in the other overhead, other expenses, other overhead line, you know, Q4 had a lot of, uh, especially the international markets, there was a lot of act activations, things being done, because the bike, bikes, the twins, uh, were reaching their uh, end of March and first week of April. So between Europe and Southeast Asia, there's a whole lot of stuff being done. Southeast Asia particularly, I have to say, had a, you know, had, this is a trade show time also. Uh, and we participated in one of those, a few of those. Around Asia, so it was largely that kind of. Now you can call it one off, but yeah, that kind of stuff. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll jump back in the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pramod Kumar from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity, uh, uh, Lalit. Uh, just a clarification on the CDC sales. Have they resumed in from April onwards, or they still? Continue? Yeah, but yes, they have. They have, but uh, with a very different process and uh, absolutely not to the same level of of buying that they were doing. Earlier. Is it a transmission issue in terms of the process changing, or you see structurally demand incrementally from CDC to be lower? No, it's uh, no. I think no, no. It's not about the demand at that level, but it's the whole process, uh, in, in the new process that they have kind of moved into, uh, and got to do with some amount of government funds as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll, uh, my next question is basically on the demand outlook now. Now we know what has uh, played out in terms of the slowdown, and uh, you, we have seen some bit of improvement in the April print uh, in terms of retail versus wholesale trend. And uh, uh, but how do you see uh, FI 20 as a year uh, onwards? And as in, uh, 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 and you guys have a fairly aggressive production target. So uh, in that context, I'm assuming that demand shouldn't be very far the way you look at it. So, but if you can just talk a bit more about uh, the FI 20 outlook uh, as a year as a whole, and probably also highlight factors which can uh, decide uh, the extent of the volume recovery. So look, generally speaking, I mean, given what we do believe the market should, for us, uh, the market should end up and, you know, so you can call it optimism, you can call it uh, a stronger view and so on and so forth. That view is equal to 9.5 lakhs production for the year. So that's a general view. And as we have gone down the list and saying where it is going to come from, how is it going to come from and all the stuff, so there are plans, uh, plans at play. I, we still believe, 100% we still believe, and time and again, uh, all metrics around the brand and the brand pull and all the stuff are still very, very secure with us. Um, um, the twins are, are doing the job exceedingly well. It's not about the volume and, and all the stuff for the twins. It's a general halo they throw on, on the entire brand. Um, and like I said, if the volumes were what we, the market needs, then you'll see a very different uh, kind of franchise. The problem will be there. There is a general slowdown. Uh, uh, especially from the customers who are non non salaried class, uh, there is a bit of a stretch at their end in their cash flows, in their businesses, and so on and so forth. Um, so th there are all these little little events, uh, not little events. There are these events, especially around the BS6, which nobody really knows as to what's going to happen, how's going to happen, which month, and so on and so forth. But generally, the brand is exceeding strong. Generally speaking, the premium trends in the country are intact. Oh, I mean, a quarter and a two here and there is not going to change that too much. So we remain very bullish <laughs> about the way the company is going. And second question, a final one on the commodity versus margin, because this is an unprecedented uh, tra transition for the industry and especially for you guys, because you have the full ABS impact and then the full fuel injection impact coming in. So uh, generally, and, 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 and the way the costs are going up and the demand environment, uh, definitely uh, one can't be expected to make margin on the cost. So uh, uh, would you, uh, in a way, look at, uh, how should one look at 
margin versus uh, EBITDA uh, or, or the EBITDA per vehicle because if I look at this quarter, fourth quarter, YOI or EBITDA per vehicle is actually not changed much at all. It's down by 2% or thereabout, whereas volumes have fallen by like 14%. So uh, is that how one, are you, you look at internally or is it like there is a margin, uh, there is aspiration to kind of claw back some bit of this percentage margins as well as, as, as demand recovers? So you go, can't ask both the question in the same breath. Yeah? So when you're saying the demand is not so great and all this stuff, and then you're talking of retaining the margin also. Uh, like I said in the last call also, the effect generally is to retain the margins. But quarter on quarter, you might not be able to do so. There will be other headwinds on the commodity prices and so on and so forth. So far, right now, they look a little benign. Uh, but then who knows, you know, when they start pick up kind of once again. And like I said, for now at least, the uh, ABS costs are settling in. Um, uh, and hence, largely, we are able to protect the the margins um, on a happy note I have to say thanks uh, a lot and future will come in effort, huh? yeah no that's fair enough thanks a lot and uh, best of luck thank you yeah. thank you the next question is from the line of Mihir Javeri from Avendis Capital please go ahead uh, I want to ask one question on, on demand side, what we said. Uh, basically, if we look at our run rate right now, it's around 63 or 1,000 uh, vehicles. Uh, we had, uh, and last year, we had an average, we had around 69,000. Uh, so, and given the uh, scenario what Lalit just spoke, uh, is, it, is it also a possibility that basically we could have a flat to negative num volume this year, uh, uh, given, the, uh, given the kind of environment we are in? That's my first question uh, with regard to demand. So, we are working towards a growth in the business this year. That's um, our objective. Um, honestly, we can't say what it will be and, um, and how the market will pan out. And beyond what we're saying as a production target that we're taking this year of 9.5 lakhs, um, we're not giving any further, let's say we can't, uh, I mean, beyond this and beyond the fact that we're as Lalit said earlier, we're working towards a growth objective this year. Like, there's not much more we can say right now about what our projections are for sales. So, so yeah, we're certainly working towards um, you know, changing the momentum right now, and uh, which certainly could happen over the next six, eight months. But, Sinan, just one question. Uh, given that the production guidance is also 950 for this year, and uh, it's the same next year as well, but uh, there has been a huge gap between what we have sold and what the production target was. So, so that's why I, I asked this question. Uh, secondly, the margins also, if you see your gross margin, there's been a gross margin erosion uh, this quarter. Uh, so would it be fair to assume, uh, or how should we look at it given that the 650cc uh, has come into play, uh, whether 650cc has similar kind of margins or lower margins, uh, because we have seen that gross margins have come lower, even the EBITDA, uh, which has obviously populated into EBITDA margin. So, how should we look at margins going ahead, uh, even with higher uh, higher 650 cc proportion being in the mix? Yeah, so generally every, I mean not always, but generally a new product will start its life slightly lower on the margin scale, and then it will over time, as traction builds up, it will, and that happened with our classic as well. I mean, we started with perhaps 20% margin, and it went up to, you know, 40 plus eventually. So, um, yeah, that's, we start life slightly lower once, the um, volumes pick up, you get a double effect of being able to increase prices slightly higher than the cost increase um, and lower cost substantially, which has happened in the past for us. So that's the game we're playing. And uh, eventually, I would say a higher CC platform will have more potential for margin than a lower CC. It's just uh, relatively natural, but um, that will take a bit of time to get there. Lucky, just I want to take out the inventory level situation right now. What's not inventory? Sorry, uh, come please. So inventory, uh, dealers pay for what they ask for and what they get. So inventory cannot be out of control in that sense for us. Uh, generally speaking, overall we still have about 20, 22 days of stocks uh, across the dealer and, and and the depots and all the stuff. So pretty much in control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Janesh Gandhi from Motila Loswal Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, so my question pertains to the margins uh, comment which you made about protecting margins. So uh, we are looking at the new range at around 28, 29% or uh, uh, we see some upside to this based on the cost-cutting initiatives? 
So right now, like, we are reporting a margin of 27.4%. So, you know, is, is it that range only, right? Is that range yet we are seeing? Uh, uh, now you can define the upper and the lower limits of the range, but generally around the range, it's, which means that it's a strong brand, needs stronger margins, big margins. Uh, and that's that's what it is. So like I said, the BS, some of the areas costs are not stabilized yet, so it will be in that 25 to 30, if you want to range for me, 25 to 30 percent kind of a thing. Actually, what I meant is, uh, is there scope of uh, further cost cutting? I mean, I understand we have been in that process for some time now, and with uh, quite a bit of uh, benefit coming through. Do we see substantial scope further from these levels of cost cutting, or uh, uh, it would be hard to come now? You know, yeah, so right now, the objective is, for example, to move to the new technologies and to do it in time before regulation. So whether it was ABS, whether it's BS6, over time clearly as, because both of these technologies, for example, are new to the country. Um, right. New in the sense that for for scale manufacturing, they were new. So over time, there could certainly be potential in reducing costs in the medium term, in especially in the newer technology areas. Um, on the other hand, there's also pressure to not perhaps pass on the entire um, cost increase to the consumer and you may not make margin on that uh, on that amount you pass on. So there's a bit of give and take on both sides of this equation. In the short term there may be some uh, more squeezing of margin just because of um, because you may not pass on the entire price increase in one shot uh, or cost increase in one shot but, they, but we also expect some cost reductions to come in um, certainly on the newer technologies which are uh, which have not been made in scale in India. So ABS, fuel injection, the very small numbers have been made in India before the regulations actually came in. And now the production has started in India by the suppliers. So there are more suppliers coming in the market and therefore the cost should come down over time as well. And for BS6, uh, are we looking to launch it uh, much ahead of the timelines or will we be trending towards Gen uh, March? We are getting ready for... Um, BS6 well ahead of time, but we will take a call based on on inventories and how we're going to uh, flush out old inventory and and be ready for the new product. So that's the tricky part. But um, certainly we're not going to go too far ahead of time either. We'll 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 manage uh, we'll manage from an inventory perspective really. Okay. And lastly, with respect to the management. Uh, addition which has happened and changes which are happening in the company. Uh, can you throw a bit more light on it about what's the game plan now uh, with Mr. Dasari coming in? Uh, how does the uh, role division happen? Uh, what to expect? That's it. Well. Yeah, so Vinod Dasi has, um, has joined as CEO of Royal Enfield um, on the 1st of April and he's been in that role for five, six weeks now. And it's still early days, so, um, you know, he's still assimilating and, uh, like I said, it's an excellent opportunity for him. Of course, the role division is that he runs the company, he runs Royal Enfield entirely. He's the CEO and fully responsible in charge. Uh, and um, my role will be uh, to support him in, in various areas, including on a few specialized areas of product brand where he has currently less... Um, experience, whereas obviously as a CEO he's got full experience on, on running a business, etc., which uh, he's taken full charge of already. So I will support him in certain areas, of course, but other than that, he's entirely responsible in running the business. So that's already happened, it's already started. It's also a great time. Um, there's a new CEO, there's, a, let's say, a shift in the business in some form where the enormous growth trajectory that we had gone through is tapered off a bit. So it's an opportune time to be able to look at Royal Enfield 2.0 uh, and how um, we're going to take it forward. So that, of course, is work in progress. There's still lots of things that we're working on uh, that, and we know this leading. So you'll, about, you'll certainly hear about that more in the, in the future when there are more plans that we can talk about. Sure. And does Vinod also contribute or uh, uh, share his expertise on the VC business side as well, concerning his background? So Vinod is the CEO of Royal Enfield, so his primary focus is certainly in Royal Enfield. Of course, he's also a board member of Aisha Motors Limited, which uh, which is the 
uh, where we have the holding for VCV. So, you know, there is some support and influence that we can expect from him over time, not yet, but uh, but his primary focus is certainly on running the Royal Enfield business. Understood, understood. Great. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gunjan Prithiani from J.P. Morgan. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two questions. Firstly, on twins, you did mention that, you know, the numbers would have looked very different if twins would have been, uh, you know, if you would have delivered twins. Is there anything you can share on the order book or the capacity ramp up of twins where we are and how we are looking at ramping, up, ramping it up through the year? Yeah, um, the twins are... Um, like I said, they've got a very strong um, pull in the market. There's an extremely strong reception. Again, in context, there have been the sales of, and I'm talking about India first, this, the sales of motorcycle above 500cc class or above 2.5 lakhs till um, Royal Enfield entered that segment were perhaps 100, 120 a month. Since we've entered, you know, we're doing maybe 2,000, we should be doing uh, in a month or more. So we've really expanded that segment tenfold already. Um, the segment of above 500 cc or above uh, two and a half lakh. So it's, it, you know, there's a huge impact, I think, in, from an industry perspective and it's very early days because as you see in the automotive industry, when a product is seen as successful and it's done well, you know, at to a certain point, then even more people. So the even more people actually start following. So we believe that more and more and more people who are interested in um, upgrading a motorcycle will see the twins as a as a very interesting proposition. Um, so we are extremely hopeful of the twins growing into a very strong franchise over the course of the next few years. In the meanwhile, our production rate has gone up to I think around it should be around four thousand, three and a half thousand last month, give or take, and increasing to 5,000 in July. So that's the overall twins production. Currently, nearly half of that is being exported and the rest is for the Indian market. And But after, uh, beyond the point, it will, of course, be based on uh, demand, uh, you know, based on orders in the different markets. But right now, it's around 50-50 for international and Indian market, which is, um, which is a very high proportion going to international markets as well right now. So... Order book, the wait, waiting list in India is about four months right now for the twins. And you mentioned this 2,000, this is 2,000 uh, units a month, uh, kind of a booking run rate that you're seeing right now, right? No, no, I was talking about the 2,000 as I don't have the exact number in my head right now, but the uh, the sales in India um, last month must have been around 1,500 to 2,000, 1,800, sorry, 1,800. Oh, sorry, April was 2000. So, sorry, I did, got the number wrong. So, April, we did sell 2000 in India, and that was the 2000 I was talking about. So, um, which is, and I was saying that the industry of above 500 cc or above 2.5 lakhs was mm -hmm. in the order of 150 to 200 before that. So, we've increased the size of the industry tremendously. So, that was the 2000 number. That was India sales last month. So this was essentially the wholesales that you're talking about. Um, I was just trying to understand if you can give any sense on the book retail side. Or is this a similar number that you're seeing in terms of booking run rate on the... Yeah, there's a four-month waiting. So every wholesale is converted pretty much immediately to retail. There's no there's no lag right now in wholesale to retail really. Okay. Or minimal uh, lag. Sure, got it. And second question I had was on the dealer expansion. Now we've continue to expand even until last quarter and clearly the sales run rate has come off pretty meaningfully. So uh, I'm just trying to understand uh, is, I mean, how are we approaching the expansion because the, are the more expansions focused in existing markets which will then cannibalize, you know, the existing set of stores or most of this expansion is in the newer markets? If any sense you can give on how we are approaching this expansion? Well, this is obviously the newer markets only. Newer markets, smaller markets, uh, in slightly, as you would like to describe, under index markets, so the big, uh, whatever, developed markets where our market share is more than the national average, hardly any expansion is happening over there. So these are much smaller stores, much smaller catchments. Uh, these are not pulling in the same, from a value based perspective, the same stuff that we do in um, Mumbai or Delhi. So this will be, you know, places like East UP, Bihar, 
mm-hmm. jargon and all this stuff. Much smaller stores. Okay, and last on the financing, if you can give some sense, has there been any uh, visible change in the last couple of months, and how is Twins is, is Twins also, you know, uh, seeing higher financing? Uh, 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 no, I mean, generally it's all been around 50, 55 percent odd uh, in that range. So don't, no change is seen. Uh, financiers are still eager to finance, also. I'm not seeing any any you know liquidity or any shyness in terms of offering finance mm-hmm. to the customers. So nothing, no change to report. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Venugopal Gare from Bernstein. <coughs> Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just a small question on uh, conversion rates. Uh, you know, in the call you mentioned that uh, it was more about footfalls reducing, but the conversion rates are very similar. So I wanted to understand that uh, from a dealer point of view, is there any messaging to move to now a push mode versus a pull mode that we have been in for, for the last eight, nine years? And uh, the reason I'm asking that is, you know, even when we visit stores or some of my friends who would be potential customers, they don't really get any phone calls after a test flight, let's say, you know, in a week or two weeks time frame. But we do see that from competition. I mean, not just competition, in, you know, which is direct competition for you, uh, but even for cars, you know. so. So is there any change in uh, the marketing process at a dealer level that we think we need to do at this stage, or is it dilutive to brand? So, not at all. Um, I think what you talked about is not push versus pull. Uh, perhaps if people are not, if some of your friends are not getting a call back, that's a failure on our part, and that's certainly not um, our objective to, to be cold to potential customers. That's not at all the case. In fact, on the contrary, we have... Uh, we're rolling out extremely, I would say, um, uh, strong processes on um, on customer engagement at dealers, which goes well beyond handing them a price list, which is the norm in, in two-wheel industry. So it is really to engage in, in selling the right product to the customer and in understanding their needs, in giving them test rights. So we are totally committed to selling and selling well. But it is selling well rather than, in fact, um, selling shabbily. Um, and selling well doesn't include, um, you know, discounts and all, but it does include very good follow-up, very good uh, customer engagement, relationships, and support. So if there were some failures there, of course, we are working hard to um, fix all of those. But um, but it's not a push as much as engagement of intending buyers that we're trying to accomplish and um, and then touching them at the right opportunity later after they've done a test ride and all to, to get them back into purchase. So we're certainly uh, selling or let's say a strong sales idea, but um, but in the right perspective of how Royal Enfield should be bought. Any other questions? Sure. sure, sure. I think it's very clear. The, you know, second thing again on the dealer side is um, more of a very generic question. Uh, see, essentially, volumes have uh, sort of, uh, you know, decelerated fairly sharply in the last couple of months. I mean, it's, of course, it's an industry-wide phenomenon, but just to put in context of uh, here on dealers, uh, since there will be a wide dispersion in terms of volumes across dealerships, uh, is there any talk of any, uh, you know, support the dealers would ask you at this stage, given that, you know, their profitability would also be under pressure, uh, or is it something which is too early, early stage and not a bother at all? I mean, eventually for me, it is about any impact on margin for you. So, so that's the ultimate, you know, uh, perspective with which I'm asking. There's no particular support or anything required. Of course, we're working closely with our dealers, and certainly what happens when um, when sales have fallen off a bit is you, you know, in a period of excellent growth, you're able to. I mean, all dealers are able to rise with the tide. But when it starts moving the other way, you're really able to see which are um, underperforming dealers and then we're working with them either to improve them or to change them or whatever it is. So it's more of an opportunity to see which are strong dealers and there's some dealers which are continuing to grow and hold their own and grow further. So others which are falling off more sharply. So it's a opportunity, I see, more to um, clean up some areas to um, certainly to support dealers where I'm not saying financially but I'm saying to basically our objective is to support them in in doing better business so um, it's in better selling skills it's in better conversion ratios 
better tools for them to be able to convert better. We've got a whole new uh, and I, I would say very good and sophisticated dealer management system which is in implementation phase along with our um, the large amount of training and process that we're putting into dealer site for them to be able to um, to improve conversions. That's very much a part of our ratio and where dealers are not able to rise to the right level of uh, customer experience, then you know, if they we give them a lot of support and opportunity, but then we have to replace them if that's the case. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Chirag Shah from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Ajay Bhanjiri. Uh, first, a housekeeping question. Uh, just wanted to understand on this. Uh, Chirag, louder, please. Uh, your voice is. Yeah. Am I Sorry, you are yeah. Yeah. First, uh, first, and housekeeping question on on this raw material cost for the quarter. If I look at RM2 sales at 53.5, and which is like, uh, which has not been seen in many quarters. So, is it largely because of inventory correction that you would have taken, or what are the drivers for this sharp jump in RM2 sales? Be it sequentially, be it YOI, or even if I look at earlier quarters, this is probably high since the 12, 13 quarters for us. Like I mentioned, uh, all the cost of new technology is switching few folds in the entire entire uh, entire portfolio move to a ABS. Uh, that and the slight commodity cost going up and down, largely were the two reasons. There's nothing else in there. And uh, uh, so, uh, is commodity pressure abating or is it neutral going ahead? Or how we do we look at that? Yeah, between March and now, it's it's uh, it's a little better than it was say. You know, prior to months, months prior to, two months prior to that. And would it be a right statement that given the demand scenario, your ability to uh, mark up this uh, ABS cost would not uh, be significant at least in the near term? It would be a right statement or you would not be looking to... Sorry, Sorry again, please. This ABS cost increase, it would be difficult to do a markup on that in terms of margin at least in the near term till demand revives. You know, the numbers you're saying is reflect the fact that we have done a markup on the cost. Okay. Okay, fair point. Uh, and second uh, was uh, on this other expense. Uh, so we, we uh, is it possible to indicate how much of this other expense is attributable to international expansion? How big that part would be for us in this? Uh, nothing, almost, uh, almost not, nothing actually. Like I said, this has all got to do with the various BTL act activities, some in India, but like I said, mostly in Europe and um, Southeast Asia. <laughs> Primarily as the twins were being, uh, this is a launch time for twins, I mean not now, but I think April beginning was a launch time for twins in Europe. Okay. Uh, and a few countries in uh, Asia as well, and uh, uh, Thailand has you know, a couple of these big trade shows and all this stuff. So, and Thailand is a, is, is a very promising market for us now. So these are those kind of expenses. It's a long list, but all BPL largely. Okay. And one last question, if I can, if I can ask, and on the demand side again, and on the product side rather, uh, would it be a right statement to make that there is some kind of fatigue, product fatigue, and unless the new product cycle starts, it uh, the the old following that we had for <coughs> brand is getting slight. Fatigue because of lack of uh, engine upgrade or transmission upgrade over the period, and that could be one of the reason of this slowdown. Well, we don't believe that. We 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 look at our um, all the data and surveys and brand track and individual model level um, that we have, and and um, by and large, in fact, we're tracking very well. And and of course, since the twins have come in, we've got uh, some bump in the brand and brand track service. So there's, uh, there's not like that. Certainly, um, you know, there is, um, you know, more, on the one hand, there is more ubiquity of a classic 350 in the market. But as you know, um, higher visibility also still drives higher growth. So there, is, there are both sides of that coin. So right now, I believe we're still at the phase. Certainly in, um, so in, in, more mature markets within India, that means big cities and richer states, the, uh, certainly the classic 350 is not growing anymore and there we're going to see Himalayan, Interceptor, Continental, GT are going to do the heavy lifting for us to grow the brand. But 
in as you get into smaller towns um, the classic 350 is still exceptionally aspirational and and drives an extremely high level of aspiration because they are coming from a totally different point of view and perspective and there is nowhere close to that level of let's say ubiquity there so there is both sides of that coin and we believe that that's you know the classic and bullet have an enormous franchise the bullet has been growing a bit in the last um, many months also so certainly as a percentage of our portfolio no, uh, why I was coming that once you transition to BSX, I, and we presume that there would be a reasonable upgrade to the to the product capabilities also, would it bring back the mojo for even Classic and the Bullet brand? That is what what we try. I was trying to refer to in your assessment in the in the in the matured market. I was referring to. Yeah, that's that's always the case. I mean, with the new product, the endeavor is always to and is certainly for us to. Um, Always take the best of what uh, people liked in a product and and improve the areas where um, improvement is required and give a fresh um, outlook to a new product as it were. So that that goes without saying. As and when there's a new product which replaces an existing one, the endeavor is certainly to give the the franchise a shot in the arm. So of course, when any of our existing product is replaced, that's absolutely the endeavor, as you're saying. And uh, Lalit, one clarification on tax rate. Is it possible to indicate what kind of assumption we should go ahead for next two years? Because this year our tax rate is seems to be slightly on the higher side, at 34.5% on average basis. I, mean, I don't know for your modeling, you continue with the same assumption, and I don't see that coming down significantly in the next one year. Yes. And here also, you know, we keep talking about mature product, mature market, product fatigue, and all those things. I mean, the general point is that 50% of our so-called customers own us for less than two years. So let the product be really old and really mature, yeah? and then we'll say, oh, you know, fatigue is coming in, setting in, and all that stuff. So people for users are, I think, slightly more loosey than what they intend to do. Uh, but we are still a very, very young company, uh, commercially speaking. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, sorry to extend your question a bit left and right. So when, you know, there's a time or two years back when, then we were seeing a uh, percentage rise, less than 500 cc bikes, because then we only had a 300 cc, uh, 350 cc and a 500 cc. And it was because as we were entering into some of these markets of North India, uh, of East India and all this stuff, we saw that the 500 guys were not that many over there, because they said, oh, we are so new to royalty at this point in time in terms of our buying, uh, while we may know of that for decades, but we're still buying it for the first time, I'll go with the 350 cc bike. So the 500 cc uh, bikes over there was like virtually zero. Um, but now, there is an early trickle of those, those chaps who own the bike for three years or some such like that. So as those customers mature in the terms of the riding behavior and the riding habits and so on and so forth, then in the next upgrade, when they look around, they may look at a Himalayan or at present, the portfolio that we have, then they look at a Himalayan and, or look at the Interceptor or the GT. That time has not even come for us to call off some of these, you know, some of, some of these products as being mature. Thank you. This was helpful. Thank you. And all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sonal Gupta from UBS Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, so just uh, on that, uh, so should we, uh, I mean, uh, Given that the BS6 is a major change, I mean, a full upgrade, a full change in terms of your engine and uh, products. So, I mean, like, uh, uh, would we see a sort of a full makeup makeover for the lineup? Uh, really speaking, you have to wait and watch for that. Uh, New product. No, but so would you to meet BS6 norms, and then there is some level of uh, new product. But you will have to see exactly what we can't. We're not announcing it. Um, you know level of changes on product. Okay, but, okay. Okay, but uh, so your existing engine range is upgradable to BS6 or do you think you'll have a new engine ground up? Sort of? Again, we have various engine platforms and I don't want to get into, and we're not disclosing specifics of which engine, what we're doing, so um, we're not going to get into that. We're, the baseline is we're 100% meeting BS6 um, well in time for the implementation, and there is some new product also on the anvil, but we'll have to, we'll tell you only when the time is right for making any announcements. 
Sure. And, and, and my next question is on the, I mean, in terms of market share, because, uh, I mean, yes, uh, you have, if I look at the 150cc plus market, I mean, uh, obviously this year uh, there's been a bit of a slowdown for you. So you seem to have lost a couple of percentage points of market share, but I'm cognizant of the fact that on wholesale numbers are very uh, divergent this year, given the amount of inventory a lot of other people have been stuffing in the channel. So on your retail, in terms of when you look at the retail numbers, I mean, how do you see your market share has trended for the full year? I mean, is there that, have you lost a couple of percentage points or it's still pretty much uh, closer to less than, much lesser than that? Yeah, if you look at um, 150cc plus, we have, if you just, because that's a very, broad market in a sense, we have lost a little bit of uh, a couple of percentage points, even I mean, wholesale retail if you equate it, it's similar. Um, that's also because there have been some very cut price 150cc uh, bikes that have come into the market, so which are really low price, so they're nearly like commuter which are uh, you know 150cc in, in nature. But so it's honestly not really a market of a, a, a product coming at 70, 75,000 if I'm right is, yeah. is not uh, it's not affecting us really but because if you look at it from a segment perspective sure so yes we have lost a bit of ground there from a, a 150cc plus market from I would say 27 to 25 or something like that yeah. but you don't see that uh, at a broader level that there is some sort of a down trading by consumers no, no. I mean, in the short term, there could be anything. There could be um, something which pulls certain consumers more, etc. And that tends to happen. But there is, I don't see that concept existing in terms of down trading. Really. It's really, I mean, for the majority of consumers, the direction is towards upgrading, and that continues. So I don't see any. We're not seeing anything in the market that will that's changing that. All right. And just lastly, could you tell us what is the capex for FI twenty? Seven crores. Planned. One thousand crores. Seven hundred crores. Seven hundred crores planned across um, new Avalam Shivajigar plant phase two across technical uh, Chennai uh, technical center, um, all of our new product and some commercial investments as well. So all of that put together is in the order of 700 crores. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jay Kale from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. And Maureen, we'll, we'll make this a last yeah. question as well. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, so my first question is basically, uh, when you do have said two, three years production and sales planning, how do you look at the market, uh, your growth versus the market growth? Uh, would you be uh, factoring in, uh, you know, are you outperforming in the market? And if that be so, then uh, what, see, last six to eight months we've seen uh, some bit of market share loss for various reasons. Uh, if at all you all have planned to outgrow the market, what according to you should change from the macroeconomic factors or from company-specific uh, factors for you to start outperforming the market uh, going forward if, when the, if and when the industry revives? So is it that your customer segment maybe currently is more impacted because of certain macro factors, which uh, where one reverses, uh, you could again start outperforming the market because uh, we have seen some bit like the earlier question alluded to, we have seen some bit of down trading in the, in the uh, market as well. So what should change for you to start outperforming the market? Well, as and when the sentiment becomes better and the market starts growing and um, there's a host of things we're working on to, to do that. Our ambition, our belief is that firstly, the short term anything can happen for a quarter or two, but certainly in the medium and long term, um, we, saw, we see no reason why um, there's a change in the overall shift where there's premiumization in the market. That we believe extremely strongly in. Um, and again, like I said, that will always happen when the right value proposition is there for the product or for the customer. Value proposition is not just in product price, but product price, place, availability, all of that put together. So with the right distribution, with the right um, product price point. And so therefore we have plans on all of these fronts. We have a lot of new products coming in. We have a lot of very interesting things going on. Um, apparel, accessories, um, uh, moving more to experiential areas, rides, community. So we're amping up all of that. Um, 
which is what draws and attracts um, and inspires people towards Royal Enfield. So it's really that rational plus irrational, uh, uh, let's say, desire that we create, and that's the that's the thing that we continue to do. And we believe that with all those things, that the combination of all of these factors, including an outstanding distribution service um, and support, um, we should certainly outpace the industry in the long term. That's very much our ambition. Okay, okay, and just if you can just uh, uh, help us, uh, is it exports and spares and stuff? Sorry, uh, come again, please. Uh, if, if you can help us with exports revenues and spares revenues for this quarter. Look, quarter wise, we don't break it up, but very soon we'll have the annual report out. You can see for sure what we've how how we've done last year. Okay, sure. Thanks and all the best. Sir. Thank you very much. We'll take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference back to Mr. Priyaranjan for closing comments. Thanks, everyone, for joining, as well as management team for taking your time out uh, for the conference call. And now... All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.